1862, the United States was a young nation struggling with internal conflicts. One such conflict was the dispute between Native American tribes, like the Dakota Sioux, and the settlers who were moving westward in search of land and opportunity. The Dakota Sioux had a long history in the region, but their way of life was threatened as settlers encroached on their land. The settlers were changing the land and taking away the Dakota Sioux's way of life. This clash of cultures and interests between the two groups set the stage for what would happen later in 1862. Something really sad called the Mankato Mass Execution. Welcome to another captivating episode of The Natives' Journals, where we embark on an enlightening journey through the pages of history. In today's series, we look at the tragic and significant chapter of American history known as the Mankato Mass Execution of 1862. As you watch this video, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss an episode of our exploration into the rich and fascinating history of the Native Americans. Before the Mankato Mass Execution of 1862, the United States was still growing and changing. It was home to many different groups, including the Dakota Sioux, who had lived on the land for a long time. The Dakota Sioux people had a unique way of life, deeply rooted in their connection to nature. Their traditional dress was both functional and symbolic. Men often wore clothing made from animal hides, like deer and buffalo, to stay warm and protected during harsh winters and hunts. They also wore feathered headdresses, which held spiritual significance, reflecting their reverence for nature. The Dakota Sioux believed in a spiritual world where everything had a spirit, from animals to plants. Their religious practices centered on ceremonies and rituals that sought harmony with these spirits. The buffalo held a particularly sacred place in their culture as a symbol of sustenance and strength. However, the situation began to shift when more settlers, mostly of European descent, started moving westward, seeking a new life in the Minnesota frontier. This westward expansion significantly changed the Dakota Sioux's traditional way of life, impacting their dress, customs, and beliefs. Amid these changes, the Dakota Sioux faced not only the challenges of adapting to a rapidly shifting world, but also the consequences of unfulfilled promises and encroachment on their ancestral lands. These pledges and land intrusions stemmed from pivotal agreements made between the U.S. government and Native American tribes using documents known as treaties. In 1851, two critical treaties, the Treaty of Traverse des Sioux and the Treaty of Mendota, left a lasting mark on the Dakota Sioux community. These treaties involved the Dakota Sioux giving up a substantial amount of their land in the Minnesota Territory to the U.S. in exchange for money and promises of food and other support. From that time on, the Dakota were to live on a 20-mile, or 32 kilometers, wide Indian reservation centered on a 150-mile, or 240 kilometers, stretch of the upper Minnesota River. However, these promises often went unfulfilled, and the Dakota Sioux faced numerous hardships. The land they had left for their traditional way of life was shrinking rapidly due to the increasing number of settlers. Their livelihood, which depended on hunting and gathering, was threatened. In 1862, the situation worsened. Poor crop yields and delays in government payments added to the Dakota Sioux's suffering. They struggled to provide for their families, and the commitments made in the treaties seemed like empty words. All these challenges created deep frustration and anger within the Dakota Sioux community. They felt cornered and saw little choice but to resist. In addition, much of the promised compensation went to traders for debts allegedly incurred by the Dakota at a time when unscrupulous traders made enormous profits on their trade. In 1858, when Minnesota became a state, leaders from different Dakota groups, led by Little Crow, went to Washington to discuss the existing treaties. However, instead of getting what they wanted, they ended up losing the northern part of their land near the Minnesota River. This was a big setback for Little Crow and the Dakota community. The land was then split into smaller areas for people to settle in. People started cutting down trees and farming on these plots, which caused the forests and grasslands around them to disappear. This disrupted the Dakota's yearly farming cycle, hunting, fishing, and gathering wild rice. Settlers also hunted a lot, which reduced the number of wild animals like bison, elk, deer, and bears. This meant less meat for the Dakota people in southern and western Minnesota 
and made it harder for them to trade animal furs with traders for other things they needed. Most of the land in the river valley couldn't be used for farming, and hunting wasn't enough to support the Dakota community anymore. The Dakota people were getting increasingly unhappy because they had lost their land, weren't receiving the money they were owed, previous agreements had been broken, and there were food shortages due to crop failures. Tensions kept rising throughout the summer of 1862. Meanwhile, on January 1, 1862, George E. H. Day, who was Special Commissioner on Dakota Affairs, penned a significant letter addressed to President Abraham Lincoln. Day, an attorney from St. Anthony, Minnesota, had been tasked with investigating and addressing the grievances of the Sioux people. His mission as special commissioner was to delve into the various concerns and complaints raised by the Sioux community. This role signified an important step taken by the U.S. government to address the mounting tensions and issues faced by the Dakota people in the region. George E. H. Day's letter to President Lincoln served as a pivotal moment in history marking the government's recognition of the troubles faced by the Sioux. It highlighted the growing need for a resolution to the conflicts and disputes that were simmering in the region. Following George E. H. Day's letter to President Lincoln in January 1862, a series of events unfolded. Day's investigation into the Sioux grievances brought attention to the deep-seated issues faced by the Dakota people, including broken treaties, land losses, unpaid annuities, and food shortages. This increased awareness prompted some initial efforts to address these concerns. On August 4, 1862, leaders from the Northern Sisseton and Wapaton Dakota bands gathered at the Upper Sioux Agency on the reservation's northwestern part. Their goal was to negotiate for food, and their efforts were successful. However, a different situation arose on August 15, 1862, when two other Dakota bands, the Southern Madewa Canton and the Wapakute, sought supplies from the Lower Sioux Agency. At this point, Indian agent Thomas Galbraith, who also served as a Minnesota state senator and managed the area, refused to provide food to these bands without payment. A meeting involving Dakota representatives, the U.S. government, and local traders took place. During this meeting, the Dakota representatives turned to Andrew Jackson Myrick, a representative of the government traders, and requested food on credit. As history records it, Myrick's response was callous. So far as I am concerned, if they are hungry, let them eat grass or their own dung. However, the precise context of Myrick's comment in early August 1862 remains unclear. Another version of the story suggests that Myrick may have been referring to Dakota women who were already searching for any remaining oats in the fort stables to feed their starving children, even if it meant mixing it with a bit of grass. Regardless of the exact wording, Myrick's response deeply affected Little Crow and his band. Little Crow later explained in a letter to General Sibley that this response was a significant factor that pushed them toward war, highlighting the desperation and anger that had been building among the Dakota people. On August 16, 1862, the long-awaited treaty payments for the Dakota people finally reached St. Paul, Minnesota. However, tensions had already reached a breaking point by this time and the situation had escalated significantly. The payments were then promptly conveyed to Fort Ridgely on the following day. Unfortunately, these payments arrived too late to prevent the outbreak of violence. The Dakota War of 1862 had already begun, marked by a series of clashes and conflicts between the Dakota and settlers in the region. On August 17, 1862, four young Dakota warriors who were desperate to feed their people and angry at the horrific living conditions and deception they had been subjected to, went in search of food and killed five white settlers, igniting the war. Over 500 settlers died. The number of Dakota killed was never counted. The actual war lasted only 37 days, but would carry profound consequences that would forever alter the lives of generations of Dakota people. The delay in delivering the treaty payments, along with the mounting frustration and desperation among the Dakota, had pushed the situation beyond the point of no return. On August 18, 1862, Little Crow led a group of Dakota in a surprise attack on the Lower Sioux Agency, also known as the Redwood Agency. Among the first casualties was trader Andrew Myrick. After being wounded, Myrick tried to escape through an attic window but was shot dead as he ran towards the cornfields. In a grim act of retaliation for Myrick's heartless response weeks earlier, 
when asked if he would offer credit to the Dakota when their government annuity payments were delayed, Myrick's decapitated head was later discovered with grass stuffed into his mouth. The killing briefly paused as the attackers shifted their focus to raiding the agency's supplies, which included flour, pork, clothing, whiskey, guns, and ammunition. This diversion allowed some people to make their way to safety at Fort Ridgely, located 14 miles away. In total, 13 clerks, traders, and government employees lost their lives at the agency, while seven more were killed as they tried to escape. Ten individuals were taken captive, and approximately 47 managed to escape the violence. The 5th Minnesota Volunteer Infantry Regiment sent soldiers from Fort Ridgely to stop the rebellion, but they were defeated at the Battle of Redwood Ferry. In this battle, 24 soldiers, including their leader, Captain John Marsh, were killed. During that day, Dakota war parties roamed the Minnesota River Valley and nearby areas, attacking and killing many settlers. They also surrounded and burned down several settlements like Milford, Leavenworth, and Sacred Heart, nearly wiping out their populations. Amid the chaos of the initial attacks, some Dakota tried to warn their friends at the Lower Sioux Agency to escape. George Spencer, a clerk in the trading store, was spared thanks to Little Crow's head soldier, Joaquin Yantawa. Spencer and a few others were taken captive during the war, mostly women and children. Some of these captives were mixed blood Dakota. Even though there were threats against mixed blood settlers, the warriors showed restraint when reminded that killing them could lead to retaliation from their full blood relatives. In the early days of the conflict, the Dakota leaders faced a dilemma regarding the captives they had taken. Some, like Big Eagle, believed these captives should be returned to the fort. However, Little Crow insisted on keeping them as hostages because he thought they were valuable for the war effort and could be safer with the Dakota. Initially, the soldiers who had captured these captives were responsible for caring for them. But as time passed, the task of feeding and looking after the prisoners was shared among more families in Little Crow's camp. The topic of rape and abuse of captives during the Dakota War is contentious. Of the white women and girls taken captive during the conflict, some were between the ages of 12 and 40. Historian Gary Clayton Anderson suggests that most young girls and many middle-aged women were forced into what Dakota men considered marriage. He mentions that young Dakota warriors had various motives for participating in the early days of the conflict, including seeking revenge, plunder, gaining honor in warfare, and even the opportunity to find a wife. There were reports of rape on the first evening of the conflict on August 18, 1862. However, there were also instances where female captives were adopted and protected by Dakota families to prevent potential harm. Following their initial successes, the Dakota continued their offensive in August 1862. They attacked New Ulm, Minnesota on August 19th and again on August 23rd. Initially, they chose not to assault the well-defended Fort Ridgely, but targeted the town instead, killing settlers along the way. By the time they reached New Ulm, residents had organized defenses in the town center, holding off the Dakota during a brief siege. While some Dakota warriors breached parts of the defenses and burned parts of the town, a thunderstorm that evening halted further attacks. Reinforcements, including regular soldiers and militia from nearby towns, bolstered New Ulm's defenses. Meanwhile, the Dakota attacked Fort Ridgely on August 20th and 22nd, 1862. Although they couldn't capture the fort, they ambushed a relief party heading from the fort to New Ulm on August 21st. This battle at Fort Ridgely hampered American forces' ability to assist other settlements. The Dakota continued raiding farms and small settlements across south-central Minnesota and eastern Dakota Territory. Minnesota Governor Alexander Ramsey enlisted former Governor Henry Hastings Sibley to lead an expedition for Fort Ridgely's relief. Despite lacking military experience, Sibley was familiar with the Dakota and their leaders, having traded with them for nearly three decades in the Minnesota River Valley. He was commissioned as a Colonel of Volunteers. Upon learning about the dire situation at Fort Ridgely through Lieutenant Timothy J. Sheehan's message, Sibley delayed his departure from St. Peter, awaiting reinforcements and supplies. On August 26th, Sibley led a force of 1,400 men, 
which included the 6th Minnesota Volunteer Infantry Regiment and 300 irregular troops. On August 27, Colonel Samuel McPhail's mounted vanguard reached Fort Ridgely, ending the siege. The remainder of Sibley's force arrived the following day, establishing a camp outside the fort. Many of the 250 refugees, some confined within Fort Ridgely for 11 days, were transported to St. Paul on August 29. Due to the Dakota War Crisis, Adjutant General Oscar Malmros and Governor Alexander Ramsey of Minnesota had to repeatedly appeal for assistance from the governors of other northern states, the United States Department of War, and President Abraham Lincoln. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton reacted by forming the Department of the Northwest on September 6, 1862. He appointed General John Pope to lead it with orders to use force to restore order. Pope arrived in Minnesota on September 16 and instructed Colonel Henry Hastings Sibley to take decisive action. However, getting more federal troops proved difficult. Pope asked for help from Wisconsin, but only the 25th Wisconsin Volunteer Infantry Regiment arrived on September 22, defending temporary military posts along the Minnesota frontier. Recruitment for Minnesota's infantry resumed in July 1862 after President Lincoln's call for volunteers. Soldiers from various regiments were dispatched as they formed. Concerned about his troops' experience, Sibley urged the return of the 3rd Minnesota Infantry Regiment, which had surrendered to the Confederates. They rejoined Sibley's forces at Fort Ridgely on September 13. The decisive Battle of Wood Lake occurred on September 23, 1862, and ended in victory for U.S. forces under Colonel Henry Hastings Sibley. Sibley's entire force, numbering approximately 1,019 men, including the 270 soldiers from the 3rd Minnesota, nine companies from the 6th Minnesota, five companies from the 7th Minnesota, one company from the 9th, 38 Renville Rangers, 28 Mounted Citizen Guards, and 16 Citizen Artillerists, left Fort Ridgely on September 19th. Sibley aimed to confront Little Crow's Dakota warriors on the open plains above the Yellow Medicine River. He believed his organized, well-equipped troops, with rifled muskets and artillery, had an advantage over the Dakota with double-barreled shotguns. Meanwhile, Dakota runners continually reported Sibley's movements. Chief Little Crow and his soldiers' lodge received word that Sibley's troops had reached the Lower Sioux Agency, approaching the Yellow Medicine River area around September 21st. On September 22nd, Little Crow's soldiers' lodge ordered able-bodied men to march south to the Yellow Medicine River. Some marched willingly, while others went out of fear due to threats from the Soldiers Lodge, led by Cut Nose, Marpia Okinajin. A friendly Dakota camp group also joined, aiming to prevent a surprise attack on Sibley's army. A total of 738 men gathered a few miles from Lone Tree Lake after learning of Sibley's camp. A council was held, and Little Crow proposed a nighttime attack on the camp. However, Gabriel Renville and Solomon Two Stars strongly opposed the plan, arguing that it underestimated Sibley's size and strength, deemed a nighttime attack as cowardly, and predicted failure due to a lack of support from them and others. Upon seeing the Army's fortified camp with breastworks, Rattling Runner and the hostile Dakota leaders decided to delay their attack. Instead, they planned to strike Sibley's troops as they marched toward the Upper Sioux Agency the next morning. On the night of September 22nd, under cover of darkness, Little Crow, Chief Big Eagle and others discreetly positioned their warriors in tall grass along the road, ready to ambush Sibley's unaware troops at daybreak. Surprisingly, at around 7 a.m. on September 23rd, a group of 3rd Minnesota Infantry Regiment soldiers set out in four or five wagons without authorization to gather potatoes at the Upper Sioux Agency. About half a mile from their camp, as they crossed a bridge and ascended onto the high prairie, Dakota warriors ambushed the lead wagon belonging to Company G. It was attacked by a squad of 25 to 30 Dakota warriors who sprang up and began shooting. This event sparked the Battle of Wood Lake. Major Abraham E. Welch, without waiting for orders, led 200 men in skirmish formation but eventually retreated, as instructed by Colonel Sibley, with most casualties occurring near the stream. After the 3rd Minnesota retreated across the creek, they received reinforcement from the Renville Rangers, a unit consisting mainly of mixed bloods under Lieutenant James Gorman, 
sent by Sibley. The Dakota forces formed a fan-shaped line, posing a threat to their flank. To counter this, Sibley ordered Lieutenant Colonel William Rainey Marshall, along with five companies of the 7th Minnesota Infantry Regiment and a six-pounder artillery piece under Captain Mark Hendricks, to move to the north side of the camp. Two 6th Minnesota Infantry Regiment companies were also sent to support them. Marshall deployed his men in dugouts and a skirmish line, advancing slowly and then charging, successfully driving the Dakota back from the ravine. On the extreme left, Major Robert N. McLaren led a company from the 6th Regiment around the south side of the lake, defending a ridge overlooking a ravine and defeating a Dakota flanking attack from the other side. The Battle of Wood Lake concluded after approximately two hours when Little Crow and the Dakota warriors retreated chaotically. Chief Mankato was killed during the battle by a cannonball. Big Eagle later explained that many Dakota fighters, numbering in the hundreds, couldn't participate or fire a shot because they were positioned too far from the action. Sibley chose not to pursue the retreating Dakota, primarily due to lacking soldiers. Following his orders, Sibley's troops recovered and buried 14 fallen Dakota warriors. While the exact number of Dakota casualties remains unknown, this battle effectively marked the end of the war. Sibley's forces suffered seven fatalities, with another 34 seriously wounded. At camp release on September 26, 1862, the Dakota Peace Party handed over 269 former prisoners to Colonel Sibley. These included 162 mixed bloods, and 107 white hostages, mainly women and children, held by the hostile Dakota camp. As Little Crow and some followers fled to the Northern Plains, more Madewa Canton warriors from battles quietly joined the friendly Dakota at Camp Release in the following nights. They were persuaded by a desire to avoid winter on the plains and Sibley's promise to punish only those responsible for settler killings. The Dakota warriors and their families who surrendered underwent military trials between September and November 1862. Of 498 trials, 303 men were found guilty and initially sentenced to death. President Lincoln had the ultimate say in the fate of the 303 men sentenced to death. Lincoln reviewed the trial transcripts and approved 39 executions, though one was later suspended. Just before the execution, the convicted men were moved to Mankato. At the same time, 1,758 natives and mixed bloods, including their families and the friendly Dakota, were relocated to a compound south of Fort Snelling. On the morning of December 26, 1862, Dakota men were hanged in Mankato, Minnesota. Under the orders of President Abraham Lincoln, they were hung from a gallows, designed specifically for the execution and killed in front of an estimated 4,000 people who lined the streets of Mankato to watch the hanging. Historical accounts document that the men held each other's hands and sang a Dakota song in the moments leading up to their deaths. This was the largest mass execution in United States history. The Dakota men convicted of war crimes faced different fates. Some were transported to Davenport, Iowa, where they were imprisoned for three years before their eventual exile. Those interned at Fort Snelling were placed on steamboats and sent to a reservation in Crow Creek, South Dakota. Today, the majority of Dakota people continue to live in exile, residing in locations like Nebraska and South Dakota. Additionally, many Dakota sought refuge in Canada to escape the aftermath of the conflict. Thank you for tuning in to this episode. If you found the story of the Mankato Mass Execution of 1862 compelling, please share your thoughts in the comments section. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel to stay updated with our captivating history and facts videos.